and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole and this week we're asking whether too much of the world takes water for granted. The United Nations wants everyone to have access to clean water by 2030, but is that really achievable? Plus the problems of water theft, the new report that suggests 70% of the world's water is stolen every year. And how a lack of water could force a billion people out of their homes by 2050. It was only 10 years ago, in July 2010, that the United Nations General Assembly first declared that access to water and sanitation was a human right. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, SDG number six, is access to clean water and sustainable sanitation to all by 2030. While substantial progress has been made in increasing access to clean drinking water and sanitation, billions of people, mostly in rural areas, still lack these basic services. The ambition is to provide every human being with access to enough water for personal and domestic uses, between 50 and 100 litres a day. That water should be safe, acceptable and affordable, costing not more than 3% of household income. And yet today, the latest figure suggests 2.2 billion people still don't have access to clean drinking water, and an astonishing 4.2 billion lack safely managed sanitation services. Clean toilets, in other words. As the world's population rises, the problem of water security only grows. Water scarcity could lead to the displacement of up to a billion people in the next decade. And the number of people exposed to water stress, and that's where demand outstrips availability, is expected to double by 2050 unless certain key issues are addressed. One of those is the theft of fresh water. A new study estimates that somewhere between 30 and 50% of the world's entire water supply is stolen every year. The main culprit is agriculture, which already accounts for 70% of all water use globally, especially in poorer and developing countries, where water regulations tend to be, well, less well policed and the penalties for misuse less severe. Water Action has forecast there may be a 40% shortfall in freshwater resources in 10 years' time, and that could send the world careering towards a global water crisis. Well, let's speak now to Dr Adam Locke, and Adam is a senior lecturer at Adelaide University in Australia and author of a recent report, Grand Theft Water and the Calculus of Compliance. Uh, Adam, your report suggests that up to 50% of the world's water is stolen. But what exactly do you mean by stolen? We all know how you can steal goods uh, and you can bypass electricity. What do you mean by stolen water? Literally just that. So it's really not terribly much different. Uh, you can either be uh, taking groundwater, for example, through a pump, uh, which doesn't belong to you. So that groundwater has been provided as a right to, to somebody to use on their farm or in their industry or whatever it might be, or even to, to to water their cattle, etc., and uh, you sink an illegal well, uh, or even a even a legal well, and you take water when it's not your turn or where you don't have the right to do so. You're stealing that water. Uh, you could uh, be again turning on a pump in a river system. Uh, you could be opening a gate on a, on a canal, whatever it might be, when you're not supposed to, and it's not your water, and you're stealing that water. So it's the same as taking a car or a cow or anything else, really. And who does stealing water hurt? Well, predominantly the people to whom the water belongs in the first instance. And so uh, they're not getting you know, th their supply as they expected. So that will impact on their production. It'll impact on their livestock. It may impact on their drinking supply. It also has a bigger impact on the people who manage water on our behalf. So if that water is coming out of a large storage, uh, or even uh, even out of a river, which has been managed in the national good, then equally they're being impacted by this. And then uh, that essentially has a flow-on impact. As I say, if it's 70 or 80 percent of the water being used by agriculture, that's going to put pressure on other users if 
additional water has got to be found elsewhere in the system to make up those losses. So, so really, it can impact all of us. And whereabouts in the world is most of the theft taking place? I would think, any normal person would think, it's in the largely arid areas where access to water is so valuable. Yeah, well, that would be a good assumption. And the simple answer to your question is, I really have no idea. Uh, we have such limited uh, data on this on this issue. Thieves obviously aren't going around telling us what they're doing. Um, we we tend, in some contexts, to overlook it. And indeed, as we showed in our paper, the United States is just one context, which in in some areas in California simply turns a blind eye to the issue and doesn't deal with it. So in our case, we looked at developed countries, Spain, Australia, and the US. I agree with you. Uh, I would have initially said that it was the developing nations with uh, less advanced institutions where the problem would be greatest, and indeed that might be the case. But uh, frankly, I, I, I think we all may know a water thief. I know I do. Uh, I used to be an irrigator, and we were aware of several people in our area that were stealing water, and as far as I know, one of them still is. And, and where is that? I'm not <laughs> It was in central Queensland, yeah. So central Queensland. Again, a very arid area. So people are going to yes. find, you know, it's an extremely valuable commodity. It is. And I, and I think that was what really motivated us to be very concerned as well, um, coming into the paper. Uh, as you say, uh, arid areas are more likely to experience this phenomenon. Uh, but the whole world is becoming more arid. Water globally is becoming scarce and increasingly so. And so um, we've got to get on top of this problem if we want to ensure that it doesn't become a major issue for us going forward. You talked initially about uh, agricultural water being stolen. Uh, is the theft of clean drinking water a problem as well? Yes, it is. Uh, and I think the thing that was most interesting to me was the Californian case study, uh, where water, clean drinking water from uh, either fire hydrants, because that is in a sense potable, um, or from uh, a hose, uh, hose pipes, you know, domestic hose pipes, was being stolen at an enormous amount to, uh, to water marijuana crops, which are now legal in that state. And of course, the returns are very high. Uh, getting a permit for those crops is apparently too much trouble. And so, of course, it's just easier to go and steal the water from somebody else, uh, in a sense, a faceless, victimless crime if you're using a fire hydrant, uh, to grow your crop and everybody thinks that um, they're better off. But, of course, everybody in the state is, 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 has their water rights diminished. So, yes, for an agricultural point of view around marijuana crops in California, yes, it's stealing domestic water in that sense. As I said before, in places like India and elsewhere, where water is particularly scarce, populations are very high, yes, the theft of drinking water has, I think, long been a problem. Dr Adam Locke, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. A pleasure. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, just what can the water industry do to help alleviate water stress? With me now is the founder and chairman of Isle Utilities, Dr. Piers Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark, can I suggest we are facing a global water crisis? If so, do you agree? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what people often forget is that we think about water crises just in the terms of running out of water, but it has so many other impacts around. Um, you know, it's not just about droughts, it's about flooding, it's about emerging pollutants, it's about habitat degradation. There's so many sort of other aspects to, to the water crisis than just running out of water. So what are the people in charge of our water doing to alleviate those problems about water stress, water security? So uh, all around the world, this is a common issue. There isn't a single utility who doesn't think about uh, how they can manage their water resources better. And there's lots of things where people are looking at doing uh, water meters and, and managing their, their, their water um, consumption better. Ultimately, it comes down to the public being engaged in the problem. People forget, for example, that for, for every piece of toast you produce, you, you eat 500 litres of water uh, and in US gallons. That's about 130 US gallons of water goes into generating a single piece of toast. And, 
25,000 litres for a microchip. And so actually what we've really got to do to manage the water resources is make sure that the public are aware of how much water is used in their everyday um, products. I know when I lived in the Middle East, uh, I found in one country in particular, uh, petrol was cheaper than water which is quite remarkable, and it was, it was bottled water as well. But I wonder, I mean, that's because of desalination, I suspect, but, uh, which is expensive. Is technology keeping up with water stress? So <clears throat> there's some amazing uh, opportunities in water. And you refer to desalination as being expensive, and you're absolutely right. You're squeezing water out of, squeezing clean water out of salty water is an incredibly energy-intensive thing to do. And, and typically, people imagine water comes from, you know, you either take it from a lake or a reservoir, or you dig a hole in the ground and you take the water out of a well, or you use desalination. There is a fourth way which is now um, gaining real traction, and that is called atmospheric water generation. It's actually where you suck the water straight out of the air. And there are a number of companies, Sky H2O and Rainmaker, uh, which have now developed credible solutions for doing that. Um, and they're much more environmental, they use less energy, and they particularly don't create this nasty brine that you, you create when you do desalination. So, so they've got all sorts of extra benefits. Uh, in Britain, um, I, this is a European show, but in Britain, I know as soon as there are weeks and weeks and weeks of rain, within a couple of months, it'll be May or June, and there'll be we'll host pipe bans. <laughs> So that's about water management, isn't it? So, and you manage the utility. Did, did, you, did you find you had to take a lot of steps to improve water management? Yeah, so, so the, the bit that gets more complicated with climate change is we're getting shorter, sharper bursts of rain. So the rain will fall out of the skies, hits the, the tarmac and the roads, and then it goes straight into the sewer system and flushes out into the, into the seas. Um, within probably 24 hours. And if we haven't got reservoirs where you can capture that water and store it, um, once, it's, once it's sort of made it into the rivers, you've lost it, which is why there's lots of talk about building new reservoirs and new storage patterns. Um, because what we used to have was rain that would trickle down in a, in a more gentle way and would then uh, go into the ground and f refill our aquifers. Now that we've got climate change with these much more intense bursts of rain, they sweep through the system um, like a bolt and we don't get to capture the water in the way that we would have done in the past. OK, so that calls for collaboration, perhaps in Britain, perhaps in Europe. But what about global collaboration? Is there enough global collaboration to help countries with very arid climates? Uh, so there can always be better collaboration. There are a variety of schemes. The World Water Innovation Fund, for example, involves um, a dozen or so utilities from from Latin America to Australia to Europe to North America, working together to share their, their learnings and their experiences. There's always more that can be done, um, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, the real help that needs to come is from utilities in high-income countries sharing their learning and experiences with uh, utilities in the low and medium income uh, countries. Um, because that's where there's, there's often this skill set that, that um, doesn't exist. Leakage is a, leakage is a great example of, of where learning could be better. Dr. Piers Clark, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, a question of education why we all need to learn more about cleaning and saving water. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. 
CGTN. See the difference. The world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Welcome back to the agenda. A recent report has highlighted the real issue behind water security. It claims that water and food shortages will create a new migrant crisis for Europe as people are forced from their homes by a lack of access to clean drinking water. The report comes from a think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace. Its founder, Steve Killalay, joins me now from Sydney in Australia. Steve, your latest report talks of a new migrant crisis, but what kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, there's a number of different ways of looking at it. What we've done is we looked at the countries which are facing the largest the, or the most the, severe ecological threats, then looked at the countries which have got, let's say, the lowest social resilience. So these are the countries least likely to be able to cope. Most countries come to what, 19 and contain 1.2 billion people uh, within, the, within their borders. Now, some of these will be placed be displaced multiple times, and that'll be, let's say, because of floods, cyclones and other natural disasters. But the thing which is truly worrying is the number of people who are going to be facing uh, shortages of water in the next 30 years. Now, this story appears fairly often in various parts of the world over the last few years. Is it building towards some kind of global or regional crisis? Well, I think there are a number of areas of the world where these can be affected by shortages of water. A lot of the time it comes back to the societal resilience and how wealthy nations are in their ability to be able to cope. So let's say countries like the United States or Australia will suffer from the water shortages. However, the countries that are resilient and will be able to put in the extra facilities to be able to capture water. That's probably true for the Middle East too. They'll be able to create desalination. But if we move to, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa, or over to parts of the Middle East, let's say from Syria through to Pakistan, that won't be true. So the countries which are the poorest and with the lowest societal resilience are the ones which are most likely to see societal or ecological collapses. Do you think the rest of the world takes water security seriously enough. Are enough people, for example, re reading your ecological threat register? Well, certainly a lot of people are reading the ecological threat register. I think a lot of people have been focused on climate change and are thinking climate change is going to be feeling these changes. And it's true they will. But even without climate change, these ecological threats around uh, particularly water and food are very, very real. For example, 17 countries in the world in the next 30 years are going to more than double their population. All of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. And this will put real stress on these countries. And without lack of, with a lack of water, then people will be starting to migrate. And the, the numbers are huge. You're talking about over a billion people, potentially. Yes, well, there's a number of ways of slicing it. So today, there's something like 2.6 billion people facing or living in countries with high to extreme water stress. So high water stress is where more than 40% of the water gets used in any one year. Extreme is when it's more than 80%. But this, by 2040, that's only 20 years ago, is going to jump to 5.6 billion people. And a large increase, in part, comes because countries like India and China move into that high water stress scenario. So that's where it's likely more than 40% of the available fresh water in the countries will be used. I was talking to one country's ambassador yesterday who was saying 
that country needs water from the neighboring country, but they're unwilling to pay for it because they said it's free in the mountains, but when it comes to us, somebody wants us to pay. Is that, is that a common um, problem? Water disputes are likely to increase over time. So if we look at it over the last decade, the number of dispute or number of conflicts over water have increased 270%. The two countries with the most conflicts over water, would you believe, are Yemen and Iraq. So now what we can see is, let's say, things like the Nile, for example. You've got Ethiopia damming it currently, and you've got 90% of the population of the uh, Egypt dependent on the Nile. There must be treaties which are formed for the fair sharing of water. And the same thing is true, let's say, through the Mekong Delta. You've got something like 300 million people who indirectly live off the uh, Mekong River. So there needs to be treaties put in place and you get adequate sharing of the water, regardless of how difficult, because if it ends up in conflict, well, in that case, then everyone loses. What can be done, do you think, to prevent possible conflict or a crisis? Is it down to people like you, to entrepreneurs? Is it down to governments, uh, corporate? I mean, who can prevent the clashes of the future over access to clean drinking water? Well, I think, really, there needs to be integrated efforts to try and solve this. Certainly, if we're looking at overseas developmental aid, that'll only go so far. I think you need better family planning packages put in place in countries which have got large increases in population. The key to it, I think, lies in being able to develop micro water industry. So in other words, how can you efficiently capture water on a scale such that you can now use it to create water industries? And the classic example of that would be agriculture. The question comes back, particularly in places like Africa, where you get huge amount of water in the wet season, then extended dry seasons. How do you capture that water, store it, then use it productively for agriculture in such a way that it's economically viable and efficient? If you can do that, then business itself, simply driven by profit, will be able to help solve the problem. Steve Killalay, many thanks for joining us. My pleasure. A lack of knowledge and education about how to deal with water security is one of the key issues behind a looming water crisis. Many organisations around the world, though, are trying to correct that, including the Global Water Partnership. Its senior programme officer for the Mediterranean, Constantina Toli, joins me now from Athens. Would you say there's a high level of cooperation around the world to try and stave off a possible water crisis? Indeed, there is, uh, there is cooperation at global level and also at local and regional level. GWP is very much promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships. We understand that we cannot solve the problem alone. Actually, no one can solve uh, water issues alone. So this is what why we need all these partnerships. We partner with different stakeholders, with organizations, but also with the private sector, with civil society organizations, in order to promote these uh, good practices that would eventually take us to water security. Is the real problem, Constantina, that people take water for granted? Not everywhere in the world, Stephen. Uh, apparently, in uh, developed countries, yes, we do take water for granted, and also the pandemic was an occasion of that. We we safely ha we had access to safe water so that we could wash our hands like uh, a thousand times a day. But these uh, 2.1 billion of people who lack access to safe water don't take it for granted. Eventually, our work, also through the Sustainable Development Goals, is to achieve this water security, to allow access and to enable access, not, on, not allow, to enable access to safe water. So for these people, the ones that have to, to walk for kilometers, and for women that have to walk for kilometers to bring some water back home, for the people that don't have clean clean water, a source of, of clean water or access to treated water, water is not for granted. Is enough being done to educate people about water? 
Apparently not. I've been in the water in the water sector for 12 years now, and while we have seen all these good efforts from many organizations, including uh, the Global Water Partnership, uh, apparently I believe that we have not done enough. Uh, usually, when we have a water crisis, either because of drought or for uh, because of climate change, we do have a campaign on water. But you will realize, and also uh, looking at what has been happening all these past months, that we don't have enough campaigns, for example, on the use of water during the pandemic, of uh, not letting your tap uh, run while you're washing off your, your hands. Uh, I believe that we are not doing enough. There is a lot to be done, and eventually you can only change people's mindsets and people's behaviors only through education. So if you don't integrate education into the, the, the school curriculum and you uh, bring up these children with these principles of being uh, not only uh, cautious with water, but eventually to value water for, its, uh, for all that it offers. It means not only sustaining our life, but it's also sustaining ecosystems, it's sustaining economic activities. So... Eventually, we need to do more uh, uh, at schools, but also educate the parents, I would say. And I suppose educate parents and children about the fact that water doesn't exist alone. It is connected, as you say, to climate um, and to energy, uh, food and all these other sectors. So it's an essential part of this formula. Indeed, we cannot. Uh, most of the economic activities are related to water, either directly or indirectly. Even in processes and productions that are not related to water per se, we need, for example, cooling. And cooling usually comes from water. You use water to cool down your, your process. Energy is the same thing, apart from the obvious uh, relation of uh, hydropower. Uh, we do have all other uh, energy producing activities would also require water, but it's also the other way around. In order to, uh, to produce water or even to pump it up, even if you have water and you need to pump it up and you have to distribute it through your water supply networks, you need energy. So these are very, very closely interlinked and they're also interlinked with other sectors, with food, for example. How can you produce food if you don't have water? Um, we, in the water sector, in, uh, among water organizations, we are really we're working industriously towards linking all these sectors and understanding their interlinkages. Constantina Toli, thank you very much for joining us on the agenda. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Stephen. Wherever human beings travel, they need water to survive, even on the moon. And the news to raise the hopes of would-be lunar settlers is that there's water even there. But down here on Earth, there are all too many water-related problems to be solved. Not enough in one country, too much in another. Water theft and especially poor sanitation. According to the United Nations, by 2050, at least 5 billion people will be living in areas where water is scarce. And that's the reason why large numbers of people are already on the move. Currently, one in nine of the world's population doesn't have access to clean water close to home. Others face an unreliable supply of water because agriculture, industry or wealthier sections of society are able to take more than their fair share. And the impact of climate change is likely to make water supplies much less predictable. We heard from the Institute of Economics and Peace that the next major migrant crisis globally will be down to water shortages. It's a timely reminder that water is a finite and essential resource that must be protected. We in the developed world uh, too easily take clean water for granted. We all need a greater awareness and more education about the global water crisis to help save the planet. Coming up on a future agenda. As the world fails to reach any of the United Nations biodiversity targets, we'll find out what the future might hold for planet Earth. Don't forget, for more Agenda content, you can visit our website or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>